All right, 97.7 Outlaw Radio FM listeners, we are live in full effect, and we got a California legend right here live on the line. And this man really does need no introduction. We got LA Mix Master Ralph M right here live on the line. I call him the Scratch Omatic, the King of Scratch. We have him right here. How are you doing this evening? Oh, man, what an intro, man. Appreciate that, bro. Uh, definitely a pleasure to be on the air. What's going on? Canada, from east to west. Definitely Outlaw Radio in full effect. DJ Ralph M. Live and direct. And I gotta say, first and foremost, man, before we just dive into this, you know, yeah. I really, I gotta got admit, man, I really love your DJing, man. Like, I'm not gonna lie, you actually, I, you actually inspired me, man, to actually get into the into the music industry and become a DJ, man. The way you, the way you scratch, gee, my God, dude, like, he'll put any DJ to shame. <laughs> hey, man, thank you so much for the compliment, man. Like I said, uh, you know, I started uh, early on. Thank God, you know, I was there from the beginning since the baby scratch. So that's always been something, uh, you know, that, that you know, like I, I was there, I'm taking those baby steps along with some of the first, like with Grandmaster Flash. Of course, he was before me, and in Los Angeles, you know, we had a lot of greats as well, like Cat, like of course, Chris the Glove Taylor, Egyptian Lover, DJ Bobcat, Uncle Jam's Army, one of the first party promoters, as well as. DJ party crews that, that were just filling up arenas, 10,000 plus, you know, and this is still like in the early 80s. So I was able to get a lot of the, uh, you know, I listened a lot, you know, before I before I went out and really started to pursue party rocking, scratching, you know, I literally had to perfect it. And that's, what, that's, what, that's pretty much where, uh, you, know, how I, you know, how things have evolved for me since that. I've been very blessed. I must say, and I don't know, I don't mean to jump the gun and get all into everything that I'm, you know, but I do like to start at the beginning of those baby years where, you know, the record player, then the radio, and then, you know, back to the, back to the, then, then the turntable, and then the sampler, you know what I'm saying? So it's definitely been evolution, an evolution for me, and as far as the timeline, and I'm just excited, bro, that's why I'm talking so fast, you know what I'm saying? How you doing tonight, man? I'm doing great, man. I'm doing great. It's kind of, honestly, man, I've, I did so many legendary interviews, you know, throughout my DJ career so far, man, but yes. I, I always yeah. get that, I've always get that feeling when I get on the air, man, because, you know, individuals like yourself paved the way for individuals like me, man, so I just got to give you your flowers, man, and say, just say thank you for giving us some of your time. Hey, man, I really appreciate that, man. I'm definitely, uh, you know, um, I'm here for you, you know what I'm saying? I'm just thankful that we are still here in 2021, able to speak on the history of hip-hop, of course, the evolution of you know, West Coast DJing, Los Angeles in particular with myself, as well as others that I will mention uh, before this interview is over. So I'm getting ready to pop a bottle just for that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Can you hear this? Can you go, let's see. <laughs> and I, I got to say as well, though, when, going yeah, back to when you were talking about the DJ in there, man, I, I remember back in the day as well, they had Uncle Jam's army. They were floating around California hard. Absolutely. Now, let me tell you a quick story with them. The, ra the way I, I discovered them was through the radio. They used to do, um, they, used to, they used to actually broadcast from the sports arena. They would, well, they would actually broadcast from all of the, of the many venues that they, that they would be performing at. Because these were like performances. I didn't get to go there in person because I was still a young. I was only ten years old, man, at that time. And I discovered what was going on on KGFJ AM, which was a radio station in Los Angeles that played soul music. They played a lot of funk music, and then later they started to play hip hop, as well as K Day. Although K Day came in the picture with hip hop, uh, of course, becoming the first twenty-four hour hip hop station in the world at one time, in, in about 1983 when Greg Mack arrived to Los Angeles. So prior to that, KGFJ was really the ruling station as far as Uncle Jam's Army is concerned. And I got to give a big uh, rest in peace, respect, um, and salute to Roger Clayton, who was the founder of Uncle Jam's Army and also the voice of Uncle Jam's Army. And um, so, yeah, no doubt, definitely salute to those guys because they were some of the greatest DJs that I've ever heard through the speaker, listening to it as a young child on the radio, pause mixing, and just like, literally, I would sometimes go to sleep at night with the recorder on, 
and they would be live on the radio. I would go to sleep. I'd fall out because they would literally go into like into the wee hours of the morning, like at least to like 1 a.m. or so. Um, so I would fall asleep. I'd hear the tape deck pop once the cassette was once I um, once it ended recording. The tape deck would pop. I'd hear the sound. I'd wake up, turn the cassette over, hit play and record, and then go back to sleep. And then I'd wake up in the morning. And then I'd be like, oh, wow, what do, we, ooh, what do we have to look forward to as far as listenership? And that's how I pretty much spent my um, early years before I really got the idea, you know, until, and before I really got equipment, put it that way. I just had a radio. <laughs> and I got to say, those, those are the good days as well, man, being able to tape stuff mm-hmm. off the radio and whatnot. You know, I, I had the opportunity to experience that a little bit before we really transist- transitioned into, like, compact discs and whatnot, man. So I used to tape stuff off the radio as well, and I, I know the feeling of yeah. that, man. And it's-, it's sad that kids today will never understand how great it is to actually just sit in front of sit in front of a radio and just be able to record stuff. It was a pain in the ass, don't get me wrong, but you had to time it perfectly, but it, it was still fun to do. Absolutely. I think to this day, man, like, I won't, it really, like, I realized one day that that's what actually taught me those were the early steps for me as an editor, you know, because with sampling, with, you know, you know, chopping up beats, et cetera, sounds, when you're truncating the sounds, when you're editing, that's what it is. Whether it's film, whether it's music, there's a start and an end to everything that you edit, you know? So that's when I started to get the concept of what that was about because we would pause mix and we would literally sometimes wait for the song to get played on the radio several times so that we could capture the part that we wanted. Now, let's say, for example, if we had Planet Rock, let's say in the beginning, you know, where he has the intro where he's like, party people, party people, and then he goes into that whole intro. Which I, let's say I wanted to, to make the part that said, yeah, 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 I would literally have to wait for that song to be played however many times I was going to do that particular edit. So that's what the, if we didn't have the record, then we would have to wait patiently and just be ready to capture that edit when they played it on the air. So that was a lot of fun for me. And we used everything that was around us. You know, I had to use all the resources. And so that's how I learned, man. And it's been, you know, that was fun, man. I remember, like, when it would come out correctly, you'd be like, oh, look, I made it repeat three times. You know, or sometimes it would come out a little sloppy, and then you'd have to go back and try to record it. So you'd have to erase that second yeah or whatever the sound was. And so, you know, it was fun, man. It was fun. It was, sometimes it could be frustrating because you're like, damn, I didn't catch it that right. You know, and then you, it was hard to hit that part again because you overdubbed it like five times and you didn't get it. So then you're like, oh. So, you know, you have to live with certain things. But it, it is what it is. You know what I'm saying? That's how we learned, and that's how I got the concept of what analog tape editing and which later would become you know real to real editing and because i wasn't doing it then but you know kept like the latin rascals or like uh you just hear these special mixes on the radio sometimes and, and even with the production like you know like a, for example just like a song like planet rock i mean if you listen to the edits in that song it's really amazing man arthur baker john Roby, or john robbie Amazing, amazing what they did, along with Africa Blondata and the Soul Sonic Force. I mean, that stuff is exciting, innovative, and um, just so cutting edge, man. I really, even to this day, man, I still get that feeling when I listen to any and all of those records from that era. And also, as we already know, because everybody knows you from, uh, you know, Hip Hop's first 24-hour hip hop station, uh, 1580 K-Day AM, but I was wondering, I always wanted to know the story. Mm -hmm behind that like how did you land that job at k-day and of course what was it like working alongside greg mack okay so for me when i started listening to k-day in 83 greg mack came into the mix he changed the format of, of, of music at that station they went from just hard soul and funk to actually electronic funk and so that's where, of course, the Planet Rocks came into play. Songs like Electric Kingdom, Toast Twilight 22, Grandmaster Flash, uh, Message 2 Survival, Scorpio, all the like 120, 110 BPM uh, tempo songs were, were, were new. And they were dance songs. And so on the West Coast, 
we were all, we've always been known for having like a fast paced electronic sound that was the party rock music for us. You know, whether it was break dancing, popping, or just getting your freak on. You know, at that time the dancers were like the freak, the smurf. You had, uh, you know, before even the break dancing, people were just about grooving, grooving on the dance floor, having fun, getting your, getting your uh, party rock on. And so, with that music, uh, Greg Mack uh, helped push that in Los Angeles. And then when the slower beats started coming in, you know, we still, you know, of course, like I remember hearing like Sucker MCs for the first time in the mix, songs like, uh, you know, other stuff like Sucker DJ, Molly Mall, Dimples D. I never forget there was a, such a super, super dope mix as that I would always hear on the on the in the mix. It was Sucker DJs over the Sucker MCs instrumental, so that was always dope because you would hear Dimples D rapping her song over the instrumental of Sucker MCs, and I just thought that was just so dope. And then when I got hit to what was actually going on, I was like, oh, okay, so he, that's what they did. And it was just so perfect. Uh, you know, at first it was just interesting. I didn't know how to do that. Although, as I progressed and started to actually understand how those elements can be combined, you can actually blend two records together and, you know, that type of thing. That's what really fascinated me about DJing and, and just party rocking. Like, I always envisioned myself rocking a crowd and even to this day whenever I just play music I could be out somewhere and I'm playing I'm playing music and I see people's reaction it makes me feel good I just feel like I just I just feel good when I see people having a good time I don't care if it's just for like a quick second I could be playing the radio really loud in my car or walking on you know going out because I love to do that go out and just you know nowadays we have bluetooth speakers so it's pretty cool we got these little speakers we can you know put on our we can hang we can hang around our necks we can roll on our bikes we don't have to have the super ghetto what they would call the big radio ghetto blaster boom box nowadays but still i still love that i still love to see the reaction of people when they hear what's coming from my speaker and it moves them it's just it's just such a good feeling man it's like giving a giving somebody a good meal and watching them enjoy that meal as a, as a chef, you know? So that, that makes me happy. And the one thing I got to ask as well, because obviously, like, you know, you just spoke about K-Day and whatnot, and obviously at a radio station, a lot of legendary individuals always make their way through the studio at some point. And obviously, uh -huh. you, you were being so, you, so young in your career, you know, it must have been a surreal moment to see a lot of these hip-hop artists or DJs or producers come through. So I got to ask you, man, back in the day, what was the one person that that you actually saw come through K Day where you were like, oh shit? Okay, well I'll tell you like this. Okay, so now since I kind of strayed away from the question and just kind of got into what I, you know, the, as far as the effect that excited me, as far as the effect that music has on people when you see them react to it, that's what excited me about DJing. And so with K Day. It was always in my heart. There was two radio stations, really three radio stations that really, really excited me and got me excited about music, which was AM 690 in Los Angeles, Mighty 690. That was like the first radio station that I really glued my ear to. And I literally just studied every song and just kept recording and just playing it back. And, and so this is like 1980. So let me take you back down memory lane before I get to K-Day, just so the listeners can understand who Ralph M is um, and what my early beginnings of uh, just being in Los Angeles, not only just a radio child, um, also somebody that, uh, that really, really appreciated and understands the timeline and evolution of early DJ mixes. So in 1980, when I started to really tune in to what was going on on the radio, we had a radio station that was literally out of Tijuana, Mexico, in Los Angeles. That was really awkward when I found that out later. Once I realized that this station was actually located in Tijuana, Mexico, I was like, how the hell is, are we getting that in Los Angeles? That was very interesting to me because that station was strong for, be, for being an AM station. This picture is like Outlaw Radio. Of course, you're worldwide now because people could tap in. But imagine at that point when you're just a small independent radio station, which most 
if not all were, this was before Clear Channel, this is before before uh, the conglomerates took over. See, it was all about independence. The people owned, actual individuals, not corporations owned radio stations. And so uh, it was very cool, it was very loose. I mean, uh, Mighty 690, I'll start there. I'm going to give you Mighty 690, I'm going to give you KGFJ, AM 1230, and then I'm going to end it off with uh, 1580 K-Day. Okay, so, so at the Mighty 690 in 1980, of course, groups like Earth, Wind, and Fire had songs like Let's Groove. You had Rick James, Super Freak. You had uh, Frankie Smith, the Double Dutch Bus. Um, what other songs do I remember? I remember like Pac-Man Fever. Like that was literally the beginning of the digital age. So it was exciting listening to Devo, Whip It. That's how I started to listen to it. Those were the songs that I listened to, which was New Wave Funk. And then so, uh, like Frankie Smith, if you listen to Double Dutch Brothers, of course, he's rapping on that song. And I always just found it so amusing. You know, I heard Rapper's Delight in, in 1980 as well. I heard that on KGFJ. Although, Mighty 690 would play a whole other variety of music, which was like New Wave Funk, which was a lot of that stuff that was coming from like groups, like I said before, Devo, um, I'm trying to think of others that were popular, but just think 1980. What was popular in 1980 as far as hit records? Beautiful, just up-tempo, um, 120 BPM plus, uh, you know, recordings that were interesting. I mean, they had the editing in there. They had the, of course, they were playing the synthesizers. It was the digital age kicking in. And so this music was coming out of the disco era. It was new wave funk if you will. Now, George Clinton and Parliament Funkadelic and Zap and um, groups like, uh, who else, um, that was really funking out at the time, they were heavy duty with it. You know, you even had groups like Heat Wave who were still kind of considered like a disco group, but they had like the groove line or they would have like, uh, yeah, that, that song, the groove line was, was a jam, you know? And then so for me being a youngster, or even like Queen, they would kill that record. Another one bites the dust. They would kill that record on the 9690. So that really got me excited about about music and, and, and just the sounds that were being produced at that time. And so even that's why cats like Grandmaster Flash would cut up Another One Bites the Dust because it had that funk. It had that soul that people just were like, yo, man, that's a great record to play. It's a party rocking record, and we can also DJ with it. So... Big up to Grandmaster Flash, of course, the, the, the godfather of the mega mix. You know, without him, there is no DJing as far as with the creative mindset. You know what I'm saying? When you push that envelope as a DJ to be creative and you can do whatever you want, you make those turntables talk with whatever it is that you're using, you know, um, especially nowadays. I mean, you can really go crazy as far as a mega mix. But that's the mentality that I was kind of like, uh, the, that, I, that, that those early seeds spawned into that for me. So I was like, ooh, I can mix that with that. And I would just always have a creative, I would have imagination when I thought about what I could do. When the, when the possibilities presented themselves as to what I could do as a DJ, I was like uh, fantasizing about it and dreaming about it. So Mighty 690, of course, I listened to that for about a year or two. And then, like, I'm literally, like, in the third grade, okay? Like, I'm talking Pac-Man fever, bro. Like, you know, Pac-Man was the biggest video arcade game at the time. We didn't have any video games other than Pac-Man, Centipede. Uh, we had Donkey Kong. We, you know, so that also tied in with the music because they were creating songs that reflected what was happening in our society. And so that was exciting for me. Like, I was like, okay, they're tapped in. Like, yo, this guy's going got a pocket full of quarters and he's headed to the arcade. That's fucking awesome. You know what I'm saying? That's great writing. That's capturing the moment. And so that, in retrospect, I feel that helped me to have um, that, that, that creative writer approach, if you will, because that's what it is. It's all about capturing a vibe, capturing energy. You know, and so anyhow, 
especially of the moment, the energy that's happening at the moment. And that goes out there to all the rappers out there, all the writers, all the singers. Like, you don't have to be monotonous. You don't have to follow what everybody's doing. Or, you know, respect to Drake. You know, of course, he's from P.O. Salute to him because, come on, man, it's not easy to be uh, 10 years, 11, 12 years in the game uh, and still be uh, relevant. You know, I mean, come on, man. Like, I don't. I'll, I'll play his records at a party if it makes people happy. I've never been that type of DJ where I won't, I, because like I said before, I'm about what effect will it have on the people in that moment. If that's what it takes to make you happy, then I'm going to do that for you because I want you to be happy. I'm not going to sit behind the turntables or whatever devices I'm using and act like, well, no, I don't take requests. And I don't do that. And I, no, no. In 2021, you have access to anything and everything at that moment. So if you don't have it in your Serato, if you don't have it in your files, it's okay to download it right there on the fly and play it for that, for that individual, whoever it is. You know what I'm saying? And make them happy. So anyhow, I digress, although uh, I feel like it's still relative to what I'm speaking on. Okay, so... So okay, now boom, KGFJ AM twelve thirty comes into the mix. Of course, I'm well I'm well versed with mighty six ninety music. I'm like okay, the Thompson Twins, etc. Now I start going more into what soul music has to offer. You got groups like The Time, George Clinton, Atomic Dog, Zap, Do Wah Diddy. You got uh, this is nineteen eighty two now. So now you start. I'm starting to gravitate towards. I'm in the fifth grade now. Now I'm gravitating towards the soul music because all my friends in elementary school are telling me, like, yo, man, you got to listen to KGFJ, KGFJ and K-Day. Those are the two stations that really play the good soul music. And then so the time is, you know, of course, with, like, the walk, cool, the songs, you know, research those songs if you're not knowing about those songs, of course, but those are all songs that were produced by Jamie Starr, a.k.a. Prince, who was also literally the ghostwriter for the time. Along with, you know, of course, with Morris Day and those musicians, those, those musicians are badass. Of course, Jimmy Jam, Terry Lewis, and, you know, um, Jesse Johnson, and um, uh, the rest of the crew that have their important part in that group, the time. So anyhow, so that music is jamming. Of course, I'm loving Prince 1999. It's coming into play. That's a little bit 82, 83. So KGFJ and K-Day are both competing. Because those are the only two stations on AM radio that, that are really like playing that soul funk music that I'm excited about now. So now I'm starting to learn more about this other music and I'm really gravitating towards it and holding on to it like, yo, what is this? So now they're playing, you know, Planet Rock, Soul Sonic Force. So I'll tell you a story really quick to add to that. In 1982, I go to a party in, in Linwood, California, which is a city right next to Compton. Linwood, Compton, you got Southgate, that's where Cypress Hill is from. I'll speak on that later. Although, just so you can get a geographical location of what I'm talking about, so I go to Linwood, California, uh, next to Watts, of course, so that whole little square, you know what I'm saying? So, um, just to give you that history lesson real quick. Okay, boom. I go to a party, I'm 10 years old, it's a Halloween party. I go to this party with my parents, and I'm seeing hip-hop for the first time. I'm seeing youngsters, teenagers, dancing, popping to the music of Grandmaster Flash, Message to Survival, Looking for the Perfect Beat, Planet Rock, Soul Sonic Force, you know, Scorpio, uh, Grandmaster Flash. You know, I could go on and on about that, but the songs of that time, Prince, of course, 1999, and the songs like... Lady Cab Driver, um, and and, the, and just and it's all that music. And you do the research on that, and you'll start to see what the party rock and music was of that time. So I, that was the first time I saw hip hop on the West Coast, and I was so impressed that when I went back home in LA, because I lived about maybe 20, 30 minutes from there, I'll never forget that party ever, because that's the first time I really saw the full impact of what that music had on people and the effect. And, and like I said, people dancing, having a good time, youngsters just listening to grown, that's grown folks' music. For a 10-year-old child to be listening to that, that's musicianship right there. That's 
not no little kids that are playing the music. That's grown people that are that are you know literally ten years older than me. At the, maybe you know Prince was probably like seventeen, eighteen, you know nineteen at the time. I'm ten, so uh, that music had such a had to, it was just so dope. Like you couldn't deny it. Those were automatic dance floor hits, and so um, that night that was the first time I really got exposed to Zap. So I go back home, and then I start listening to KGFJ even more, and that's when I started to hear those songs, and I made that connection. I was like, oh, that's the song I heard at that party. Oh, press play and record immediately. Like, he had just started already. And I was like, oh, damn, that's the song. That's the song that I heard. And so that's how I built up my, um, you know, uh, if you will, my my understanding of it, my knowledge base of those titles and who, who was who, because I didn't know who Zap was, and I knew who Prince was because actually I knew who Prince was actually through the time. I didn't listen to any of the Prince early stuff. He like you know, he had some other records that were kind of explicit. That was like Dirty Mind. He had you know he always had a kind of like sexual innuendo in his album covers and in his songs. Different, you know, he had songs that were just, you know, very sexual. Although the adults were playing that, so my friends in elementary school would listen to that. They'd come to school, they'd talk about it. I would be listening, and I'd be like, okay, what's that song? I gotta go. I gotta go do the research on that. And so I was all this information that I was being fed, right? And so it was exciting because I knew that those were the songs that got people excited. And then, so I knew, like, okay, my, my friends are telling me their older brothers are playing. And so I'll never forget, once I started to understand that those were, were classics, cult classics to this day, I just never let that go. And even to this day, when I listen to songs, like from the time, the first album, you hear the songs like The Stick. Yeah, I mean, come on, that's the liminal, right? The Stick. You listen to The Stick from the time. You're gonna be blown, man. You're gonna, it's gonna blow your mind if you're a, if you're a serious punk fan like myself, you know. And so, um, it was exciting, dude. I mean, I could go on and on about that because, you know what I'm saying? It was just a child being exposed to these creative, funky, synth sounds, uh, dope bass lines, great musicianship, you know. And so, anyhow, boom. Fast forward to um, let's say '83. But about a year later, that's when K-Day starts. I start noticing what K-Day has to offer, and they're kind of switching the format up now. They're actually playing stuff like craft work, numbers. You know, even though KGFJ touched on that, uh, K-Day was really, like, pushing the envelope and starting to play more hip-hop, like Run DMC, um, you know, Soul Sonic 4. There weren't that many groups at the time. They would play Rapper's Delight, and I'd hear stuff like uh, with the one Eighth Wonder, you know, from the Sugar Hill Gang. So that stuff was getting played on the radio in Los Angeles, and we were just new. We were just, it was new, and it was exciting. And for me, like, I'll never forget those moments, because that's what I feel made me um, want to become not only a DJ, but also a producer. And thanks to two of my cousins on my father and my mother's side that actually gave me the input. To, to excel that desire. You know, once I started fusing those ideas that they were giving me, like, hey, you know what, DJs become producers. And then I just thought that was so exciting. Like, I was like, ooh, that sounds like, that sounds like what I want to do for the rest of my life. You know, and then so I never let that go. I just kept growing, I kept, you know, listening to music, understanding what was going on as far, as much as I could. Like, I still didn't understand music. It never pushed me to want to learn music. I just wanted to, to listen to, to the different music that was coming out, and I wanted to see what the effect was on people. And so then later when I started to understand what it was all about and how to actually create music, that's where I'm kind of like at, at this point in my life, where it's actually clicking now. I mean, it took a long time for me, man. I don't know, you could call it redundant, but I really have, I really, when I set out to do this, I really set out to become like somebody uh, and a force to be reckoned with in the music industry. And I'm not done yet, you know what I'm saying? But um, yeah, man, that's just, and then Katie, of course, from 83 on up, became the number one 
only, it became the only rap radio station, you know what I'm saying, in Los Angeles. So, okay, so check this out. So when I, okay, so I'll fast forward a little bit from 83 to 85. I'm studying K-Day. The mix masters come into, into the, uh, they start doing the mix show. Because Uncle Jam's Army would share some of the, some of the uh, air time with some of the new guys that were coming in, which were like Tony G, um, Spin Masters, of course, Han G, Evil E, who became, of course, Ice-T DJ, um, Brian Syndicate. And so I would start listening to certain mixes that were happening on K-Day. This is just a little bit after Uncle Jam's Army, because they were the next guys. It was Uncle Jam's Army, it was K-Day Mix Masters, of course, named after DJ Bobcat, who was an Uncle Jam's Army OG. This guy went on to tour with LL Cool J. He's the guy that wrote I Need Love, going back to Cali. I mean, he even helped produce, he found the, the sample for Mama Said Knock You Out by LL Cool J. So he went and toured with LL for like, I would say, at least four, five, six years, you know? And so, you know, and not to take away from any of the greats on the East Coast, but he, this guy was from the West Coast, L.A. Posse. You know, and so we didn't know that LL Cool J was working with an LA DJ. Well, I didn't even know half of the stuff that Bobcat was involved with, along with LA Posse. They produced that first album. You know, or actually it was the I'm Bad album that they produced. Rick Rubin produced LL Cool J's first album. But the second album came along, and then that's when you started to see Bobcat. And I'd already been familiar with who he was because of KGFJ and because of Uncle Jam's Army. And of course, Kato, because he named. He, he named 1580 K Day Mix, but he gave it the Mix Masters title. I think at first, not even I think, I know that Greg Mack, he was kind of like, he was noticing that Uncle Jam's Army were the biggest party promoters, DJ Crew, it's, they threw the biggest parties in LA. So he wanted to compete with that because he knew that he had, he had, some, um, he had some action with the radio station and with his ability to be able to go out and create parties at the roller rinks at different um at different places around town different clubs and stuff and he could broadcast it live on the radio just like how uncle jam's army was doing i'll never forget hearing uncle jam's army they were the first guys to, br to bring run dmc out to los angeles to perform sucker mcs it's like that and here we go live on the radio i recorded that I never forget being at home, and I was like, "Oh my God!" They just did a concert on the radio, and this group—I didn't even know their name yet. I didn't even know it was Run DMC. I just knew their songs. I knew Stuck in MC because I'd heard that in the mix. I knew um, it's like that, and I knew—I didn't know Here We Go. That was the first time I'd heard Here We Go, and I heard it on the radio performed live in LA. I was broken out, man. You know what I'm saying? So. Uh, you know, so so then, of course, those two stations were going head to head, but really they were one because of Uncle Jam's army. And then I think after a while, KJFJ just said, "Hey, man, I think they threw the towel in." They were like, "Nah, we're just gonna do soul because we don't know hip hop like what you guys are doing over there. We don't." They didn't accept it. It was not accepted yet. Yeah, the hit records, cool, but they weren't. They were gonna go out on a limb to try to play any and every rap record that came out. No way. So that's where K-Day took over, and that's where K-Day actually create, created their own lane, you know, with K-Day, Mixed Masters, uh, Greg Mack. It really, they were technically, it was called, see, Greg Mack was competing with Roger Clayton, which was Uncle, Uncle Jam's Army. So there was like a military tie, underlying title, if you will, although Uncle Jam's Army, for me, it's like P-Funk, Uncle Jam's, you know, like One Nation Under a Groove. Etc. So um, that's where I feel that they, that's where they got that that name from. But Greg Mack, who was still somewhat of a novice as far as hip hop is concerned, he didn't really know how to put it together where it would sound hip hop. He was like trying to create a group called his DJs that he was going to create to compete with, with with Uncle Jam's Army were called. And I remember him speaking on that, and he says that in interviews that he was called the Mac Attack Marines. So he was trying to approach it from a military standpoint, which was kind of like, mm, nah, that's not really going to work, man. That's, that doesn't sound right, especially being in Los Angeles. So, so Bobcat suggested that he name it, call it the Mac Attack Mix Masters. Name them Mac Attack, man. He was one of the Mix Masters. He's one of the original Mix Masters, along with Tony G, Spin Masters, 
uh, Jammin' Gemini. Those were the first cats that I listened to. And, of course, World Class, World Class Wrecking Crew with Dr. Dre, Clientel, and Lonzo. Although they would have a special hour that they would mix on, on the uh, Mix Masters. So they weren't technically Mix Masters, but they were just part of the show, of the Mix Master show. So the Mac Attack Mix Master show was born in Los Angeles in, like, I'd say mm, going towards the summer of 84. Like that that summer where Prince drops, you know, Purple Rain, you're hearing, you're still hearing Uncle Jam's Army float around on KGFJ and on K-Day and on KACE, which was, was an mm-hmm. FM station. So they would do special mixes for certain songs. Like I remember they would have the Electric Kingdom edit, Twilight 22. This is electronic funk, but this is B-Boy breakdance of music. You know what I'm saying? Like it's still, it just had an edge to it. And so, um, okay, boom. So now the radio is popping off. And those three stations are pretty much the ones, you know, KJLH, KACE, KGFJ, and K-Day. Boom, KGFJ falls off. K-Day still holding the, 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 the title on AM radio. I mean, AM, I mean, K-Day used to have a strong frequency. They would go pretty far out outside of California, so a lot of people knew about K-Day and they knew about mix, the Mixmasters. Once Bobcat started touring and going on tour with LL Cool J and all that, then that made way for the other next guys to come into play, which, of course, like I said, was Tony G, Tony Gonzalez, you know, DJ Joe Cooley, DJ M. Walk. That's where those guys came into the mix, and those guys became superstars on K-Day because those were the mix masters. And so those were the guys I was listening to as well, and they took it to another level because the mixing was incredible, the scratching, the precision, Everything that they did was like, yo, he's killing that record. And Greg would let, Greg Mack would let them just go off. So k Day Mixmasters, you know, were radio DJs with a, with a battle DJ mindset. That's why Joe Cooley would turned out to be one of the greatest DJs, with, you know, with titled the King of Scratch on the West Coast for a long time, from like 86. From the time they dropped Everlasting Bass, Rodney O and Joe Cooley, from that time, that's when they really like became the duo that was like they they were the kings, bro. You know what I'm saying? Straight up, Joe Cooley was a superstar DJ in Los Angeles. We 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 all respected him and and, and wanted to be like him. You know what I'm saying? As far as like the technique and just just the whole aspect of of um, you know the whole aesthetics of it. You know, along with Tony G and along with um, M Walk. Well, who later became DJ for Tone Loke and then started traveling the world in like, like 87, 88. Right in like 88 is when, Tone, it's when M-Walk got his big break, you know? And so that segues kind of into, into where I come into the picture. So then right around 87, 80, right in late 87, I try out for the Mixmasters. Mind you, when I was prior to that, or maybe a year or two before that, I tried out for K-Day because they would do auditions live on the radio. So I went to the tryouts. I show up with no records, no nothing. I just thought that they were going to accommodate me because I'd never been to a DJ battle. So it would tell us, like, what a fool, right? But I had to learn my lessons. I literally had to learn. And, and that night was a very uh, priceless lesson for me. So, boom, I go to World on Wheels, which was right down the street from where I grew up in my neighborhood. And I get on the radio. And that was like the first time I get on 1200s. You know, I wasn't, I, I, I was, I didn't even know what to do. I literally was backwards with it. I put the pitch, I played the record really slow. I played It's Time, and I played it like at minus eight. You know what I'm saying? As opposed to plus eight. So um, it was just, it was just a great learning lesson for me. Um, two years later, after that, I go back, and I go to the actual actual location, which is a roller rink called Skateland USA. World on Wheels, Skateland USA were the roller rinks that K-Day, Greg Mack, and the Mixmasters would broadcast from. So they would do it live on the radio. They'd come on the air like around, I think from like 10 p.m. to like 1 a.m. in the morning. And it was called Friday Night Live. And so that particular night, they did the broadcast from World on Wheels, and it was the Mixmaster tryouts. The auditions. Every DJ in Los Angeles was there. You know, I mean, the place was packed, and everybody wanted to try out to see if they could get on and be down with Mac Attack Mixmasters. So that was the night that M Walk made it, and then Joe Cooley made it, 
And then uh, who else joined that night? Uh, there was a few others that they got. They got a few others, and then they they, they were kind of rotating them, and then maybe they, they kind of like went their ways. You know, I don't know what happened to them. I heard a few of them, and then they kind of disappeared. The ones that stood strong were M. Walk, Joe Cooley. I'm trying to remember the third guy. So the third guy, Julio, came after that. But Julio G. So my point with all that also is that K-Day, Mac Attack, Mixmasters, we all evolved into greater things. You know, Tony G, of course, produced Kid Frost, Mellow, Mellow Man Ace, their first records, their first albums, their hit records and hit albums. And this was huge for Los Angeles and for the West Coast. I mean, we literally, you know, I mean, Tony G literally changed the format on FM radio across the country in, in the United States because the power, power stations weren't playing hip-hop. But when that Kid Frost record, La Raza, came out, that record took and struck the name, along with Mellow Man Ace, Mentirosa, which, be, which became the Spanglish rap, you know, sensation, the, 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 you know, the phenomenon, if you will. It was just, you know, it was short-lived, but it also became Chicano rap on the West Coast. So, um, but, but those are the godfathers of Spanglish rap, Mellow Man Ace and... And Kid Frost because they were they were the ones that hit to this day. I mean, nobody's been able to top them. They still top the charts with their hits. You know what I mean? And so Tony G goes on to become a great producer, entrepreneur. Joe Cooley already had that status, and you know he, um, you know, of course, you know, taking you know just just incredible mm -hmm. music. Go back and listen to Rodney O and Joe Cooley. Listen to anything and everything from them from 80, 85, 86 on up. You know, on Egyptian Empire Records. And then so uh, M. Walk, of course, goes on tour with Tone Loke. So that made way for the new guys to come in. So guess what? I go and try out at 135th and Central Avenue, which is deep in deep Compton. That's where the, in the movie, if you see N.W.A. straight out of Compton, that's where, um, that's where N.W.A. does their first performance. So I had to go there to, perform, to, to audition. And I had my strategy. I just waited. I was literally the last guy to go on while they were still on the air. And so this time I was prepared and I was ready. And I didn't and I knew when to attack because I knew that if I got on too early, I could get lost in the sauce and I could be easily forgotten. So I said, Let me wait. Let me just wait. Let me wait. And my timing was, was on. When I got on those turntables towards the end, they were just about to go off the air. I just brought it. I gave it to them. I played a little bit of everything. I, you know, I started off with the tempos, slow. I matched with whatever was going on as far as the tempo, and then I went into the fast stuff, and I just started showing skill. I remember playing like Davey DMX, One for the Treble, um, you, know, and, you know, the bonus beats, and I started scratching, and then I played this other song that was brand new at the time, which was a song called Cracker Jack, which was on Delicious Vinyl. It was like their first record release ever. And DJ Romeo was there because M Walk had produced that record. A lot of people don't even know. Like M Walk produced like the very first record on Delicious Vinyl, along with Mellow Man Ace, who had one of the first all Spanish raps on Delicious Vinyl. And M Walk scratched on the record at the end of it. So you know what I'm saying? Like it was like all these little things were bubbling and being born. So um, I was able to capture that moment. I remember M Walk. Rome. I remember Romeo when I played the Cracker Jack uh, instrumental by um, Romeo and Masteron. Listen to those bonus beats, man. They're incredible, man. They use the Let's Dance to the Drummer's Beat. They just use the hits. All the different notes that were on that record when you get to the break, they played that over an 808 beat, and they, it was very well done, man. Like, it's one of those records you could scratch over, just like how the cats love to scratch over these, these beats that. Uh, you know, for hours on end, like you could scratch to that record for a long time and never get bored of it because it was just open and had the, the perfect hits as far as the notes. And then um, it was dope. You know what I'm saying? And then so he was excited. So Romeo comes up to me, he goes, yo, oh, man, thank you for playing my record. He was like, you bought my record. He was like, thank you for playing my record. So that was like, okay, well, he gets a point for that. He's, he's, he's paying attention. He's buying the music that's relevant to what's happening, and he's putting it in the mix. We need that. We need a DJ who has that ability, who can recognize what's going on, and not just in his own world. So I gave them a little bit of everything. I played some, some classic stuff, 
blended that in right after whoever got on before me. Like, I didn't stop the music. I didn't say, okay, here's my intro. Here, I'm going to start over. No, I just went with the flow. And so as I started to blend the music and then get into, the, you know, going back and forth I'm in the mix and then scratching and then that whole thing, by that time, I won them over. And Tony G, he had seen me around here and there, although he didn't personally know me. I mean, I was 15 years old. This guy was an OG. This guy was already getting stupid respect from cats like Ice T and, you know, uh, getting respect from, from other DJs that would come on the West Coast, like, you know, DJ Clark Kent, you know, rolling with, with Dana Dane at the time. Um, just stuff like that, man. So those guys were, were big time to me, you know. And so when I was able to impress them, and they actually selected me, it was really hard work that paid off for me. That dedication and the time that I put into the, to, and the desire, you know, I dreamt about that. I used to, that was my biggest, at that time, that was, that was my biggest accomplishment, was to become a K-Day mix master. Because I knew that I had to be with the best. And they were the best at that time, along with Uncle Jam's Army and others. Although, Uncle Jam's Army and KD Mixmasters were the only ones that I heard on the radio consistently. So I knew that if I was going to, if I was going to further my name, I knew that I had to be with them. And there couldn't be no other. There could be no other. I couldn't just be in a regular DJ crew. I had to be with the radio crew that was on the radio. You know what I'm saying? With the DJ crew, excuse me, that was on the radio. Radio crew is a whole nother thing. Radio crew in Los Angeles, that's when you get Radio Tron, which later became Radio Tron for the movie Breaking. But the radio crew originally was like Ice T, Chris the Glove Taylor, and others. I can't name them right now because I can't remember. Although, that's early LA DJ beginnings. And I'm just so happy and so thankful that I can even talk about this like this. Like, that really is DJ Ralph M's early beginnings in Los Angeles. And that's what spawned into all these other things, like Kid Frost and, you know, of course, the Cypress Hill, House of Pain, Funk Dubious, and that type of thing. So, I mean, not to take you on a hell of a long journey over the hill and across the river to Grandma's house, but that truly is the early beginnings of my story and my life as a, as a Los Angeles DJ, if you will. And I'm going to be honest with you, man. That's one hell of a great story. I, me personally, if I go to my grandma's house, I'm not going to get a dope story like that personally. You know what I mean? So I got to say, man, I got to say it sounded like a humble beginnings, man, but it most definitely sounded like a hell of a run as well, man. And it, and I'm not going to lie to you, man. It's a great story because a, a lot of the stuff that you actually said, a lot of these individuals might not really know the true origins behind like just a radio and you know what I mean? Stuff like that out in California, man. So I got to say, I, I appreciate you for sharing that story, man, because I, I listened to your other interviews, man. You never went that in-depth with that per with that particular story. Yeah, man. I really wanted to do I want to do something special for you, man. I want to do something special for the listeners who are tuned in right now and for Outlaw Radio so that you can have something in your archives that's not the same thing. See, that's what ended up happening after a while. And not to jump fast forward because I want to get to all these other greater things, but, like, after a while, I was only getting recognized for working with Soul Assassins and Funk Dubious, which is, a great, which is one of my greatest accomplishments as well. Although, I really want people to understand that Ralph M. literally has a foundation in L.A. history, uh, hip-hop, DJ, music production, etc. But I want people to know that this guy didn't just jump on board and start uh, making beats on the SB-1200 and all of a sudden just became part of Solar. No, it's like, dude, I worked for that. I literally went through the 10,000 hours of dedication, hard work, and struggle to get to that point. And, and, and so while we're on that, um, you know, while we're, we're still on the same timeline, if you will, that's how I met DJ Muggs. That's how I was able to meet Sun Doobie. That's how I was able to get those opportunities. Now, if I, if I, if I may, around 1988, right, right after, okay, so now I'm on the radio and I'm, 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 you know, I'm getting more notoriety. I'm starting to hear my name on the radio. That's such a good feeling. I'm like, oh, shit, I made it. I'm like, oh, damn, Greg Mack is saying Ralph M. Like, Ralph M is going to play Ralph M's mix coming up in Traffic Jam or in the 9 o'clock mix or the Saturday night Mix Master show. You know, and so now I'm excited because now I'm like, that just meant everything to me. 
for people to know and understand that, you know, for, for me to get that notoriety, I had to, you know, I, I, that was the most important thing. And, you know, so I never forget going literally on the bus on Saturday nights with a, with a reel, with a two, not with a half inch reel in my hand, you know, literally trying to get to the station on time to get this mix delivered before 11 p.m. or before 10 p.m. because that's when the last mix would go on for the show. The show, mix, the Mega Tag Mix Master show would, would um, air from 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. every Saturday night. And that's how we were able to break new music because that's what mix shows were about. Now, we're still dealing with an independent radio station now. All across the country, we're dealing with independent radio stations. So Clear Channel and these corporations had not taken over yet. These were still mom-and-pop-owned radio stations. And that's what's missing today. That's why everything is just so controlled and so formatted and so, and, and so cloned if I may use for lack of a better term. You know, everything sounds the same, everything is the same because it's all about the advertisement. And that's when I got on the radio at the tail end of the Mixmasters and K-Day, that's when I discovered that. That's when I saw behind the curtain. And I was, I was like, oh, no. You mean I can't do this? You mean we're not going to be able to have fun like how I grew up listening to this? Now I'm like, got to follow all these rules and don't play this for too long and don't play that. And if you guys can't do this, you can't sneak in any more new music. We used to be able to play whatever we wanted. You know, I grew up listening to these guys literally battling on the radio, like showing off their skill set. And then now it's all—it's like, okay, guess what? You guys, you guys are scratching too much. You guys, nope, you can't repeat the record all that many times. And, you know, you can't have fun no more. Now you got to follow the format, play these records, do this. And so we still found a way to, 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 to we still found the loopholes and, you know, the, the ability to express ourselves because that was important. So then, you know, so anyhow, with that being said, right around 87, 88 is when that started to come into play. But, but you know, we still were like, nah, we want to still play, you know, this classic electronic funk. Well, I don't care if it's five years old. We're still going to sneak that in the mix. And we're still going to cut up It's Time and Planet Rock and our favorite go-to DJ records along with, some of the break beats that were coming into play because on the West Coast I didn't know about break beats. Yeah, we knew about James Brown. We didn't understand. I didn't understand the concept of it. I knew that some of that shit was sounding exciting. Like it was like, okay, good times, you know. And you, that's disco, you know. But there's a break in that song. You know what I'm saying? Disco breaks, funk breaks, soul breaks. You know, you got breaks in almost every type of music. If if you know, if you're listening for it, you can find it. You know, gospel music, etc. cetera, you know. So for me, um, that's when we got exposed to Ultimate Breaks and Beats, you know, Ultimate Breaks and Beats. The, yeah, Ultimate Breaks and Beats. Yeah, all the different. So that's when I started learning about that, but it still was, like, I still wanted to play hip-hop and play my go-to favorites, and then I started to incorporate this new stuff that was happening with, of course, sampling and, you know, like all that stuff that was coming into play. So I was excited as well. I just knew that I had to adapt. And I was like, oh, no, this is a whole other thing. I got I to gotta learn about this music because what is this? What is this song? I didn't know that this song even existed. And then now it's got this, oh, that's what such and such used for this. And then you're like, oh, okay, I hear that. I hear that that break part is what this guy used for an entire song. And I'm just like, okay, okay, we got to listen to that. So that was cool for me because I adapted not only from, like I said, from a live musician, you know, perspective to a sample-based, you know, uh, style. And then that was cool. We just adapted and we, we accepted it. And then cats like Marley Mall started to really come hard with Big Daddy Kane and Juice Cool. EPMD started stepping on the scene. You had Tone Loke and Delicious Vinyl who understood the concept of breakbeats and how to create a song around breakbeats and how to string breakbeats together to make a hit record. And, of course, NWA and, you know, all that whole history with Ice-T as well. You know, Unknown DJ, another great producer who's unsung, I feel, on the West Coast. Unknown DJ and uh, DJ Slip. Those are the guys that are responsible for, like, I mean, Unknown DJ is responsible for 6 in the morning with Ice-T. That's literally gangster rap on the West Coast. That's the pioneer of gangster rap. You want to give it to... You want to give it to somebody, give it to Unknown DJ, because he's the guy that inspired 
the, the boys in the hood. You know, and Troy, and then on the East Coast, Spooly D with PSK. If you listen to those three records, they kind of follow the same cadence. Peace for the people who you can't understand. Six in the morning, coming up, police at my door. Cruising down the street in my six four. You could do a mix with all three of those records and literally play verse for verse and hear the cadence and the relation in that cadence of the rap. Right? Peace for the people who you can't understand. You know, and so you got so DJs, listeners, hip hop lovers, you may know this already, although I'm just here to reiterate that, that that's very important as far as understanding. You could break that down to a child and have him understand what it is, what's the magic behind making great records. Sometimes other records spawn into, you know, like one record will spawn into many records. And people will be like, what is it about that record that, that is so, that just, it just, it's like a magnet. What is it about that record that I just, I hear something in that record that I like, that I've heard before, but I can't put my finger on it. And that's the magic of, of production, songwriting, of you know, being being a magician. You know what I'm saying? Like, you, there's certain things that you got under your hat that people are they're like, damn, dude, when he figures it out, he's really going to slap himself. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Although, you know, uh, some cats never figure it out. And so for me, it took me a long time to understand music, notes, and the relation of that language. But I wanted to do things right. You know, and I wanted to, like, not only be a, be a DJ with a, with a reputation, highly reputable turntable list as well as a producer. And now in this stage of my life, I just, overall, I just want to be recognized as not only those things, as well as a great musician, a great producer, someone who's really like, this guy never gave up, and this guy really brung, like, something super special with his creativity from all those experiences, from all that time that he, that he, you know, like music is, I am music in that regard. You know what I'm saying? And that which I'm going to bring forth to leave from my legacy. Like, I don't have children, biological children at this time. I'm not married. I'm married to music. That's my leg. That's, those are my children. When I create a composition, I look at that as like, that's one of my children. And, and if I never have children in this world, for whatever reason, I want that to be part of my legacy. I want people to reflect on that and say, you know what, he didn't come here to do that. He didn't come here to be married, have children, and do all these different things. He came here because of that music and because of that dream and that passion and desire that he had as a young child that was sparked by his elders. You know, my older cousins, I had two cousins, one on my mother and one on my father's side. They really put that, like I was saying earlier, you know, they really sparked. They didn't have to teach me anything. It just fed me knowledge. And from there, I took that and started to incorporate what I was seeing around me. And that's what led to K-Day Mix Masters. So, you know, of course, hanging out with DJ Muggs, who I met in 1988. I was still in high school. I was literally on my, I'm not like, 11th grade. I'd already been DJing on K-Day for about a year. But throughout that whole experience, I was meeting cats like King T. I was meeting cats like... Uh, of course, so, you know, 783, who DJ Muzz was a part of, and that's how we became friends, because of the music and because of the desire to want to further, you know, continue becoming greater and, and push the envelope of, of hip-hop at that point. But I like all types of music, so at this point in my life, I almost feel like I could do anything. If I focus on it and I understand what it is that I'm trying to accomplish and what my approach is, I could produce anything at this point. And so I'm still thankful for that, man, because it finally clicked. You know, really, really, like, you have stages in your life where if you have that desire and that drive to want to learn it, learn that and understand the language of music, you can do it. Some people get it right away. Others, it takes years. For me, it took a long time because I just wanted to be, I was redundant, and I wanted to be right. And what is that? And how does that work? And why do you do that? And then I just, I got so caught up in the technical aspect of creating music and what musicians do, but I got lost in, hey, you gotta feel this, you know, you gotta feel it. Don't just get caught up in the technical aspect of it. And that's what happens today. People get caught up in, in equipment. They get gear happy. 
They're like, oh, we can use this and we can use that. And just because we can use this and that doesn't necessarily mean that the music is going to benefit from that. You can use less and still come up with a great hit. It's been proven. You know, Scats have made incredible music on some basic Casio keyboards. They just found the right sounds. They found something, they created it, and they stuck to the script. You know what I'm saying? Of, of what they were trying to accomplish. And so now I get it. I see that. It's like, hey, dude, it's not about all this million-dollar studios. And, you know, I used to get off on that. I'd be like, yeah, man, I would love to just go all over the world and record at all the different, all the best studios. And, wow, I'd be excited. And then I realized one day that it was like, hey, man, for what you're doing, you know, you can't do all those things in one song. So you got to be, it's all about your approach and, and what it is. Is it palatable? You know, are people going to enjoy what you, do you enjoy what you're doing? Or are you just just throwing a bunch of stuff against the wall to see what sticks? You know what I'm saying? So I don't get off on that no more. I get off on like, hey man, Mad Lib and the MF Doom created an album off of an SP-404, S, uh, or SP-303, I believe it was, a 303 you know what I'm saying? Like, the, what was the other one? The 404, the SP-404, the 303. Um, I got an SP-404 SX, right? But, uh, you know, I don't, now I get off on the fact that it's like, hey, dude, them dudes, they created the Mad Villain album just off of uh, um, a right and left signal. They didn't even I, they didn't even isolate the track. They just recorded Mad Lib's beats. He, 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 you know, he, he made sure that the levels were right on the tracks. He delivered them. He recorded them. And he didn't even have to go back and into things like, oh, you got to fix the kick. He goes, no, you can't fix the kick. Why? Because it's all part of the whole composition. And we can't isolate anything. All we're going to do now is, is fine-tune it with the EQs and master it. And that's it. And that's all you get. And sometimes a minimalist approach is, is, is healthy. Not having all these... All this, you know, cutting edge million dollar equipment, and you can't produce shit. You, as a matter of fact, it's not that you can't produce shit; it's that you end up producing shit. You know what I'm saying? Like you missed the point. So I, I you know, I, I, I went through that. You know, I got gear happy, and I was just letting engineers do whatever they wanted and stacking five EQs on one kick. And I'm like, then I finally started talking to others, and then they was like, hey, yo, whoa. Learn how to work one EQ before you use five on one particular sound. Don't get gear happy. Listen to what you're creating. Does it sound correct? Does it sound duddy? Does it sound like you got a blanket over the speaker? Because if it does, man, you're in trouble and you're heading in the wrong direction. The approach is sincere, although not effective. And so now if you backtrack and you say, hey, strip it down. Take that off. What, do you, what is that? Now I question the engineer, you know? And so I learned from that. And I had to go through some, some serious lessons to get to this point. So, you know, minimal, the minimalist approach is, is healthy as well. So all producers out there, MCs, DJs, cats that appreciate, listen to what you're actually, what is, you know, do you like what you're, what the, you know, do you like what's coming through the speakers? I mean, not just from your lyrics, but from the music. Do you like the tone of it? Do you, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's okay to say, hey, can you take that? Can, let me hear it without all that shit you got on it. Let's go right back to the beginning. You got all the levels right. But let's take all, all those processors and all that, all that stuff that you got, all that outboard gear that you're using. Strip it down. Okay, see, that sounds more natural. That's what we started with. Now you've just destroyed my song because you went all over the place thinking that it needed all this million-dollar shit, and it doesn't. <laughs> this is hip-hop, you know, or whatever music it is. Like, you know, make sure that you just don't overdo it, man. And that's what's happening today, man. We're in the middle of Clone Wars. We started, I mean, we saw that coming. I'm not mad at kids. I'm not mad at, at the youngsters. I'm not mad at the new producers. I'm not mad at anybody. I just, I can't even force them to change. So there's no need for me to even complain. Although I do tell people, hey, man, find what's, find your medicine. Find what makes you happy. Don't worry about what they're doing. Because if you're sitting there wasting your time listening to them and, 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 and uh, complaining, you're not living. You know what I'm saying? You're just, you're just, you're, you're, um, you're, you're accept. not only are you accommodating and wasting some time on some bullshit that you don't even need to invest in, 
You know what I'm saying? It's making you a bitter person. Fuck that. I'm a happy person, dude. Why? Because I choose the music that I want to listen to. I choose what, you know, I want from what makes me happy. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to sit there, and even if I don't like Drake, I'll play his music at a party if it'll make somebody happy. Now, that doesn't mean I'm going to go home and listen to that shit. I might reminisce and be like, yo, that was cool how I played that Drake record and all the girls, like, looked at me and started dancing and loving me and shit. I'll, I'll take that home with me and maybe relay that record and be like, yo, that was a good feeling, man. I'm going to play that record again. Why? Because I see the reaction that I got from all these ladies. You know, how, I, how it rocked the party. How all, everybody just all of a sudden tuned in and wanted to dance to that song. That's what I get off on. You know what I'm saying? And that's important. Knowing and understanding when to play a certain song and how to rock a party with that song. That's the key to DJing. For me. Not for everybody else. I'm not here to preach. I'm just here to tell you my perspective and how I feel about what it is that I do and what makes Ralph Pham who he is, especially in 2021, because I really, truly get it now. You know what I mean? So, no more criticism, just constructive criticism, if you will. And the one thing I got to ask you, man, because when you brought okay. up, you know, DJ Mug a few moments ago, I remember reading... Yeah, yeah that at one point in your career, you actually briefly DJed for uh, Cypress Hill while DJ Muggs was actually absent. I was wondering, what's the story behind that? Why was Muggs actually absent? And of course, what was it like DJing for Cypress Hill? Okay, cool, man. I'm glad you put me back on track, man. And, and, you know, like I said, um, that story right there is, is so cool because I met Muggs through K-Day. And so once I connected with Muggs, I had a port a port of five studio, which is Tascam, port of five studio or four track, and so he had an SB twelve hundred, and at the time he didn't have a he didn't have a recording device. I did. I didn't have an SB twelve hundred, and so I wanted to further my knowledge with that SB twelve hundred. Like I was excited about that drum machine. I was like, ooh, I could do. Ooh, you could do. Wow, you could sample on that, and you could create. You could make songs on the fly. Without having a, you know, so that was something that was cutting edge for that time. You know, you had the NPC 60 and stuff. Something about the SP 1200 just excited me. It just looked simple. It just had a had a cool look to it, and it didn't look like the learning curve on it was difficult. Now, mind you, there's still a learning curve, and there's something to it. That's a 10 second sampler. You know, NPC 60 was maybe 30 seconds or something if it was maxed out or something like that. I never got into the NPC 60 at the time. I just wanted. I just wanted that SP-1200 because I knew that that was the, the, what everybody was producing at that time. I knew that NWA's records had been done. I knew Marley Mall was using it. I knew that Public Enemy and Shockley and the Bomb Squad were, were using that particular device. So with Muggs, we created a friendship based on, of course, SP-1200, DJing, and wanting to push the envelope as far as hip-hop rec recordings are concerned. So we were able to come together with the four track, with the SP, and he started become, you know, he already had, okay, so I'll tell you like this. He had Real Estate and Funky Feel One. Those were the two songs that, that he was primarily working on. Those were the two hit records that Cypress Hill had, had started already, along with Light Another, which was Feel the Effects of the High which had a Cool in the Gang sample in there. And I remember I thought it was a cool song. I was like, feel the effects of the high, be real, light another. Okay, so light another, real estate, and um, funky feel one. With the three songs, and when I stepped into the situation, were already, those seeds had been planted, although he was trying to perfect those songs and make them better songs. Like, he was like, okay, we're going to change the verse on that. We're going to add this to that. You know, he was always constantly working on that because he was learning as well so he was incorporating ideas that would make sense he wanted to make a really really good record and he knew that cypress could do it he already had success with 783 although he wasn't producing for 783 other than a few remixes and stuff that came later like in 89 that's when we really started hanging out that's when i would start going over to his, to his house i was in 11th grade and he would come and pick me up from high school. I'd have the four track. I'd be ready to go and record. Or sometimes we'd come back to the house. He'd be like, yo, I'm going to take you to the house. We'll pick up the four track and you go go back to, to the spot in Hollywood, which at the time he lived with DJ Aladdin. 
DJ Aladdin had just won the 1989 uh, New Music Seminar, so he was he was on top of his game, and he was probably the most popular DJ, uh, you know, at that time, being affiliated with Ron Syndicate, DJing for Dub C, with Crazy Tunes, so they shared a two-bedroom apartment, just Aladdin and Muggs, like, no one else lived there, it was just Aladdin and Muggs' place, but Coolio, Dub C, Crazy Tunes, of course, those were his best friends, those were his production partners. That's who he worked with, and they would be there all the time. On the other side would be Muggs, Be Real, and Sin, and Stun Doobie. That's how me and Stun Doobie got closer, because we knew each other from school. They had seen Muggs and and, 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 uh, and Stun Doobie knew of me, and, and Be Real and Sin, too. They knew of me from K-Day. They never met me, but they knew of me through K-Day, and they knew of me because I had been featured on a compilation record, which was on Capitol Records in 1988 going into 89 and it started to really make its name for itself in 89 so this was m walk of course another k a fellow k day mix master who was djing with tone loke and when wild thing and funky cole medina started to get that that 24-hour video rotation on uh, mtv those were the biggest records on the in the world i mean that record sold more than we are the world at one time wild thing Outsold the, the, the Michael Jackson "We Are the World" song, right? So they were doing big shows. Arsenio Hall. They were getting K Rock. They were getting all the FM stations. They were getting the rock radio stations, okay? Because they had the Van Halen sample in there with Wild Thing, and then Funky Cole Medina, of course, was the follow-up hit, which took off as well. I mean, you still hear that on on uh, you know FM radio out here in Los Angeles, here and there. So Tone Loke was a guy that pretty much grew up in my neighborhood. He was an older guy, but he went to my high school. He went to Fairfax High School in Los Angeles, and he also lived maybe about, mm, I'd say, half a mile from me, you know? We lived in the same neighborhood, pretty much, you know? And so, at that time, once he started to get that notoriety, that record took off. I mean, they were on tour. They were going everywhere. They were, like, nonstop. But now they're touring, and this is where this whole evolution of West Coast is because now Easy E and NWA are starting to make a name for themselves. Yo MTV Raps is, is big on the scene. They're, they're finally, we have a rap video, a rap music video outlet. You know, of course, thanks to Fat Five Freddy and, and uh, Ed Lover and Dr. Dre and Team Money, you know what I'm saying? But, um, so anyhow, boom. So now we're starting to see them on TV. We're starting to hear more about hip hop and seeing it visually. So, um, of course, him walk. He got the opportunity to work. He got a record deal with Capitol Records to produce a compilation with various artists. So my first feature literally was with an MC from Philadelphia named Tab Doe, who Greg Mack connected me with. And this guy literally, we were, it was like KRS-One meeting Scott LaRock. I like to say it that way because at the time he was li literally was living in the home shelter. You know what I'm saying? At the home shelter. He stayed there. And so we talk on the phone. He called me. I literally met, I met this rapper on the phone, and we and we conversed for months before we even met each other. I was already his DJ. He was my MC, and we just connected every other day. Every opportunity we got to talk on the phone, we would talk. I would scratch for him, and then he knew. He was like, okay, you could, oh, you, you nice. He was like, okay, yeah, you definitely going to be my DJ. And he was like, I remember he even wanted to change my name. He was like, Ralph M. He was like, man, we're going to have to do something about that name, man. we gotta, we got to figure something out, man. you got to be like DJ Supreme or DJ. we got to come up with something, man. I don't know about that name. And then so for me, uh, Ralph M., I always wanted to put a label on. I wanted to, I was DJ Crush prior to that. And then I always felt like, I just, I don't know. I just felt like I didn't, you know, I wanted people to know me for who I was. Even though, you know, a lot of times you got Jazzy Jeff, and you got Marley Maul, and you got Grandmaster Flash, Grand Mix for DXT. I mean, these are big names. When you see and hear those names. So I guess that's where L.A. Mixmaster for me comes in. Because I figured I was a K-Day Mixmaster. Although that's something that's in the history books, I still wanted to be relevant in today. With today's, you know, um... DJ names. I wanted to kind of like re I wanted to add another another title to my name, if you will. So as opposed to K-Day Mixmaster Ralph and I was like, yo, L I'm from L.A., L.A. Mixmaster. That sounds like something that I could not only use for myself. 
I could use for others. So I could be like the L.A. Mix Masters. Like, I don't mind sharing that because a lot of us are from Los Angeles, and, and, and it's okay. That Mix Master title is like Grandmaster, it's like Scratch Master, you know, et cetera. So moving forward, um, I never changed my name. And then I became Ralph and the Mexican, thanks to DJ Julio. DJ Julio G, who was on tour with, with um, Mellow Man Ace, and we just, he just came up with that name, and he was like, yo, man, you're the Mexican. And I was like, you know what? Thank you. I, I, will, I will take that. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, because I didn't think of that, but that name was coined for me, and so I ran with that. And so um, I took a break during that time from 89, like right in, like from 89 to 90, K-Day had went off the air. So I just went on and just did my 12th grade senior year at Fairfax High. You know, that record with M-Walk came out, Tab Doe, it's called I'm Just Amazing. The guy was incredible. He had, he was the amazing boombox, Tab Doe. And I know I linked you on one of the songs just so you could get it. It's on YouTube if you look up Tab Doe, T-A-B-B, Doe, D-O-E. And it's Tab Doe and DJ Ralph M. I'm just amazing. We did another song on that on that album, and I'm I can't think of the song right now because I haven't gone back and listened to that record. But it was a dope ass song, also. Uh, you know, it was done on the SP 1200, and that song I'm just amazing. We actually used the sample for uh, what later became um, for LL Cool J, Big Old Butt. If you ever listen to that song. Uh, Big Old Butt by LL Cool J that came out in like 1989, 90. Anyhow, when we used that out, that record, when we used that on SP 1200, I had never heard that beat before. So technically, we are the first group to ever use that guitar sample that you hear in that song. You listen to Big Old Butt by LL Cool J, produced by LL Posse, and then you listen to that M Walk record along that you know he produced it with Jan and James who was another fellow k Mixmaster mix master that got in when we got in. He went on to produce for Lighter Shade of Brown, Sitting in the Park, Latin Activity. Um, what was the other one? Uh, uh, in, in some, in most of those cuts that, that were the hits, Jamming James, uh, you know, James Calvin Carter, a good friend of mine also, along with DJ Romeo. Those guys, they really helped keep the imagination going as far as production for me because I would hear them talk about SB 1200 and just and I would, I would hear how they would judge records and I just got I was able to get you know I was able to get some insight as to how to listen to the new hip hop records that were coming out like Chill Rock G Big Daddy Kane Cool G Rap when that new music started coming on we were at K Day and we were playing those records I remember playing Poison I remember playing um, you know of course Public Enemy you know don't don't believe the hype uh, you know. Bring the noise, Big Daddy came raw. Like we were those, we were the only DJs in LA playing that because there was no other outlet. De La Soul plug tuning. I mean, myself along with them are responsible for bringing those records forth, you know, uh, on the airwaves and sneaking them in the mix because K they didn't know about those records and then they got hit to them and then they added them to the format. And that's what I mean when I when I say that when it comes to a mix show, it's about having the freedom to to be able to explore new music and share that new music on the airwaves with the audience that's, that doesn't want to hear the same songs that you played all week from, you know, from sun up to sun down. We want to hear something new, and that's what the Saturday Night Mix Show, Friday Night, and that's what the Saturday Night Mix Show was about. You know what I'm saying? And so um, I would have never heard songs like Schooly DPSK. I would have never heard songs like um, I mean, so many from electronic funk to, to hip hop. If it wasn't for that mix show on Saturdays, because we were recorded, they'd be like, "What is that record?" We go to the record, we go to the record, uh, to the record store, and if we didn't know what that title was based on what we heard in the song, we'd have to go and be like, "Yo, you ever heard this song? What is this?" And then the, the guy at the record store may know of it, or all of a sudden that record would come in within a week, or he might know, and then he would order it for us. So, you know, and then that's how, you know, it was crazy. Marley Mall Scratch. I would have never have heard Marley Mall Scratch by MC Shan if, if Tony G never played that. But those guys were like West Coast cool hercs, if you will, at that moment. 
Bronx style Bob, like, you know, songs like a Bob Diddy Bob, Bronx style won't stop. Like, I heard that on K-Day Mix Master Show. I went crazy when I heard that record, man. And I'm, it's amazing that I know him. Like, we, we're friends, you know, we're, we're actually, we're cool. You know, like, I'm like, dude, if I would have known that I'd know all these guys later in life, cross paths with cats like Chris the Glove Taylor, who was in the movie Break In, Ice T's DJ on the record Reckless, I would have, I would have just, wow, you know, I'm still in awe. You know what I'm saying? And so uh, from that point, you know, of course, with Muggs, same thing. If I would have known that I was going to meet Muggs and then end up, you know, being coming a part of Soul Assassin, Cypress Hill, House of Pain, et cetera, wow, like that's, a, that's truly a blessing for me, man, you know, and a major accomplishment in my life. But with Muggs, man, he worked hard on that, man, and I'm just happy that I'm there to tell the story of the early beginnings and also being associated with that. That's exciting for me, even to this day. To see them win a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, hopefully they'll get the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame at some point. Hey, man, that's, that's, I feel like that's my award as well. You know what I'm saying? That's my trophy, too. Even though, like you said, you know, going back to, I was the, one of the original DJs. I am actually, alongside Muggs, I am the original Cypress Hill DJ. Because, I, because that's what Muggs presented to me. He said, yo, I'll let you take over the group once I start getting busy with production. Because that's what I want to do. I want to create Cypress Hill to become something huge. And I'll let you go on tour with them and DJ for them. At that time, we, I wasn't even a production guy yet. I was still just a DJ and a four-track guy, and I was just studying what Muggs was doing as far as the, 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 um, the mindset, how he was producing them. Like, I, didn't, I, never, I never got hit to how you create a song. You know, I, never, I, know, I never saw anybody in action. So when Muggs was producing and working on the four-track, I learned a lot. And then Crazy Tunes, rest in peace, Dub C's little brother, he taught me how to work the four track correctly. So he laid out how you pan everything, and, you know, he, we became great friends also, you know, along with Dub C. Um, you know, rest in peace to Crazy Tunes forever, man. I salute that guy forever because that's the guy that taught me how to work the four track properly. And um, he was incredible, man. Listen to DJ Crazy Tunes, man, all his four track mixes, mega mixes, and stuff like that. That's. That guy was amazing, man. To this day, his four-track mixes excite me, you know, because he just was so in that. He had such an imagination when it came to that, man. He could he could say anything with those records, man, because he knew he really is one of the godfathers of the scratch sentences, you know, along with Tony A, who was from the Rhodium. You know, those guys, badass dudes, man, as well as Dr. Dre. You know, and DJ Yella. I think DJ Yella needs to get a lot of respect, too, because he was there, man. And he was the guy that had a lot of great ideas as far as, you know, some of the early Scratch records, that, mega mix records that were coming out, like Scratch Party, Scratch Dance, of course, is Victor Flores and Chris the Glove Taylor. I mean, I'm talking these rare records that came out on these independent labels. Literally, they were one-offs. They would be considered like bootleg records, but they had a mega mix on it. Sometimes they would be double-sided, and most times it was just one side. They would be like, okay, you get scratch dance. Research that, DJs and people out there that, that are into, you know, production, uh, you know, editing and mega mixes. Listen to scratch dance. Listen to scratch party. Listen to mix trick. You know, M-I-X-T-R-I-X. Those are records like, yo, they say, like, the rumor is like, oh, Dr. Dre did that one. Oh, Yella did that one. Chris the Glove did that one. You know what I'm saying? Because they were literally under the radar. You know what I'm saying? Those are records that incorporated all your favorite songs at that time all on one record. So you could go buy that record and be like, dude, I got Electric Kingdom. I got Freakazoid. I got Midnight Star. I got, you know, I got all, I got like 10 different groups on one mega mix, and it's all the best parts. You know what I mean? Sometimes it would be like some other stuff that you never heard of. You'd be like, what is that? You hear it later. That's how I got hit to Smurfy's Dance by Spider D. I heard that on, on Scratch Dance. You know, I, I mean, excuse me, on Scratch Party. You know, when you listen to Scratch Party, you hear Smurfy's Dance and they're mixed in with, uh, with, uh, uh, with Malcolm McLaren, Buffalo Gals, and you hear Rocket in there. And you hear, um, like, all these cool songs, dude, for that time, man. Break dancing and just partying. So, like I said, that was adult music for me. And then so I would see the adults party to that. Other youngsters, like, you know, the teenagers. I mean, to me, they were adults because I was still, like, 12. 
but I still knew that that's what rocked the party. You play those records, those those parties, those records are sure shots, even to this day. I could throw that on and mix it in with something new, if it makes sense, and, and they won't know the difference. They'll be like, yo, what was that? And they just, or they will, if you see, if you got a party rocking, and nobody notices what you're doing, that's a good thing. As long as you don't clear that dance floor. And it's happened to every DJ. We've all thrown on a record that cleared the dance floor. That's part of, you know, that it is what it is. You know what I'm saying? You can't win them all. Um, so anyhow, with, with uh, you know, going back to mugs and stuff like that, you know, once I've got that 10,000 hours in alongside him, just, you know, sharing his vision and, and, and being allowed to become someone that, uh, you know, would become a soul assassin along with Funk Dubious. And, of course, me and Son were already a crew. By the time I met Muggs and started hanging out with them, DJ Aladdin, at that apartment, Son Dubia and I already knew that we were going to connect, that he was going to be an MC, that I was going to be DJ for. And then uh, that's when I started to, like, understand that I had to develop my production chops. And then I had the opportunity from 89, in 1990, like right at the tail end of my, my senior year in high school, I got the phone call from Tony G, from a friend of mine who was also another K-Day Mixed Master, DJ Tracy, who worked with Body and Soul, who on Delicious Dino, produced by Def Jeff, and he also DJ for Def Jeff at times. And he worked on the In Living Color TV show with Damon Wayans and the Wayans Brothers and all that. Um, he was one of the guys that was actually creating the music for the dancers, the Fly Girls. Whenever you hear those breaks on that TV show, for those that know, you could even YouTube that. In Living Color, which was a big show on the Fox TV network in the early 90s. You know, that's where cats like Jim Carrey came from. That's where Jamie Foxx came out of. That's where, you know, of course, um, you know, uh, Keenan Ivory Wayne, that was his show. That was his concept. So anyhow, DJ Tracy, rest in peace, calls me, and he's like, yo, Tony G's looking for you. He wants you to go on tour with Kid Frost, because uh, whatever, call him. Boom, I call Tony G. He had just completed. Yeah, because that, that time stretch from the time that, that, that I started my senior year and then K-Day went off the air, it didn't go off the air, but they didn't bring the Mixmaster show back for the last year of 89 going into 90, simply because the station had already been sold. So they didn't know what they were going to do with the station, so they were already kind of like not bringing certain things back into play. So the Mixmaster show, some, it got canceled. It became something else. And then Greg Mack was like, okay, well, there's, there's, we're not doing the Mixmaster show right now. We're not going to be doing it from this point on. So then I was like, okay, cool. Let me get back in my senior year mindset. You know, let me, get, let me at least graduate from high school so I can continue. I already knew what I wanted to do. I knew that I wanted to become a producer, and I knew that I wanted to DJ and travel the world. Those were the two options at the time. The DJing, I had a stronger experience with. So I knew, like, okay, you um, you need to go and, and find a group or someone that you can work with. And that's when Chris Cloth came into play. And so uh, with that being said, you know, Frost took me all over the world. Thanks to Tony G, and thanks to um, that opportunity, which he landed a record deal on Virgin Records, man. That was huge. That was huge for me because this guy's on a big-time la label with uh, Janet Jackson and Ziggy Marley and the Wailers and uh, who else? The, um, uh, the You know, Lenny Kravitz. Uh, who else? There was like a whole, like, top 40... Records. I mean, Virgin Airlines. It was Virgin Records, Virgin Airlines. Like they had Virgin Mega Stores. Like they was like that was all associated. And so that was one of the biggest labels at the time. And for a Hispanic guy doing hip hop to have a hit record and to have those opportunities laid out in front of him from public relations to tour support to you know they had the ability to blow Kid Frost up. And he became. He became, uh, he got a Billboard Award that year for Best New Latin Artist. And I'll never forget, they didn't present it on TV, but it was like Gloria Estefan, who was a famous musician, you know, uh, Latin American uh, you know, musician, singer. Gloria Estefan awarded Kick Frost with that, you know, with that, or she read, you know, with that award, if you will. And so um, I went all over the world with Kick Frost. That's the first time I'm going to Europe. Now I'm first class. Now I'm like, literally fresh out of high school, like literally not even a month 
I graduated in June, like uh, June of 2000, uh, excuse me, June of 1990. It was like June 20th or something like that. Right at the beginning of summer. By 4th of July of that same year, I'm stepping on stage with Kid Frost at East L.A. College, and we're doing this big show for Power 106 because that's what helped Power 106 and these clear and these FM stations across the country, the power stations. They weren't even clear channel stations yet. They were just power stations. All across the country, that record is charting, and people are demanding that record. That record is big. So now we're getting ready to set up to go on a big tour, which was literally the first power tour. We were on tour with all these different freestyle groups, like Candy. Oh, Candyman was the other hip-hop group. Mellow Man H was the other uh, hip-hop artist. Those three records right there. Candyman, uh, he was an artist. He was also down with Tone Loke. He was a dancer for Tone Loke. He got a hit record with Johnny J, of course, of Tupac fame, later who became Tupac's producer, rest in peace to Johnny Jackson, Johnny J, who was Mexican. A lot of people don't know that Tupac's, one of Tupac's best producers, How Do You Want It, and other songs, notably that song, for the most part, as well as others, he produced that song. And he produced that song on the SB-1200. At least the drums and, and the, 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 the drum sequences and patterns and stuff were created on SB-1200. So Johnny J, we're all on tour together. That's how I meet Johnny J, right? And so, um, yeah, we were rocking shows, dude. We did like three months, two, three months worth of shows, you know, all across the country. And so, uh, Kid Frost is blowing up. I mean, these are my first experiences of touring with an artist. And what an opportunity, because I stepped right into the limelight. From July 4th, 1990, when I stepped on that stage at East L.A. College for that Power 106 uh, show, that there was like a, it was like a, it was a concert, man. That place was packed. <laughs> and, um, yeah, my life changed forever, man. I saw how people reacted to me when they saw me on stage to him. I mean, life, it changed, man. Next thing I know, I'm going all across the country for us, getting on airplanes, getting in limousines, eating at, the, you know, at uh, high-end restaurants. You know what I'm saying? Like, all, from one day to the next, and I knew that I, that I was living, and I was riding the course of what my timeline was supposed to be. Because prior to that, I didn't know what I was going to do. I was like, damn, okay, so... All my friends, they're getting ready to go to college. They're getting ready to do this. They're doing this. They're doing, what am I going to do? Like, I, I wanted to have something to say. Like, oh, I'm going to do, uh, study psychology at, uh, you know, at, at some, you know, college, university, et cetera. But then it hit me. And I said, you know what? Don't lose track of what you're supposed to be doing. And I just went with my intuitive, with my intuitive senses. And I knew, even though all of 12th grade, I was like, I already know what I'm going to do. I'm going to be, I'm going to go. But I didn't know how it was going to work out. K-Day was already off there. And it wasn't off the air, but the Mixmaster show was. I wasn't going to K-Day as, as uh, consistently to do any mixes at that point. So at that point, all I had was my belief system that I would succeed. And then I got that phone call. That's why I had the last contact with everybody for a few, like for about six, seven months. You know, and then, boom, all of a sudden, guess what, Ralph? You got an opportunity to go on tour with Kid Frost now because you're Hispanic, he's Hispanic. You got, you, you're going to become the Mexican, you know, and that's, that didn't happen just yet, but that was the beginning footsteps of what spawned into a great relationship, not only with Tony G, but with Kid Frost and the Latin Alliance on Virgin Records, man. And what an exciting time for me, man. I mean, to this day, I'm so grateful to them for that opportunity. And I gotta say as well, Kid Frost is a phenomenal individual. I had the opportunity to chop it up with him, I think, last year. And I mean, one of the most humblest individuals. And I just want to give him a shout out as well because yeah. recently he actually kicked COVID 19's ass, man, and came back 10 times stronger. So, shout out to Kid Frost, yeah. man. Hey, we love you, Frost. Definitely stay strong. Definitely appreciate you for all the opportunities that we've shared and the lessons that I've learned because of you. You know, he's like my big brother, man. This guy literally was like almost a decade older than me. I mean, as I stepped into the situation, I mean, I was 18 years old when I got that opportunity, you know? And like literally like still my first six months, 
of being 18, you know? Graduated high school. Man, that guy, man, we had so many experiences and so many good times. And we rocked so many shows. I mean, that's the guy that took me to, to, to London, to England, to France, to Germany, to Amsterdam for the first time. I went to uh, Barcelona, Spain. I went to uh, Italy with him, Venezia. Uh, we went to S South America. I mean, when it came to international fame, Virgin Records and Kid Frost definitely were on the same plane, if you will, in terms of that label being able to provide what that artist needed to become an international success. Perfect. You know, it was awesome, man. It really was. And even to this day, like we did a show a couple of years back, maybe about two years ago, uh, for the Radiotron, because he's a member of Radiotron. Of course, he comes from, you know, the, the, him, Ice T, uh, as well as others that, that were those guys that were at the radio, not only at Radiotron or part of Radio Crew, but the original Radiotron crew. Well, Radiotron became, that was what it became for the movie. Radio Crew was the actual, was that, that was the actual title for those individuals that were hanging in that facility. You know, the DJ by Chris the Glove Taylor, Egyptian Lover, Ice-T, Kid Frost, Hen G, Evil E, uh, cats like Sugar Pop, who was, you know, B-Boy Dancer, was one of the early pioneers of B-Boying here on the West Coast because he brought that here. If you see the movie Breaking, not even a movie, it's called Breaking and Entering. Breaking and Entering. Breaking and Entering. YouTube that for all the cats out there that really want to see what the uh, what's, what the predecessor to the breaking movie, what became the breaking movie, became on that big screen. There's a documentary that came out that was not supposed to be released, but that's why I saw that documentary. I knew that those were all the bits and pieces that became what that movie signified. You know, the script that made that movie. It was amazing, man, to see that. Because I didn't see Breaking and Entering in 1983. That went way beyond my head. I think they only played that like on the public station. I never saw it because it wasn't meant to be seen. That's what it was. They, they showed it here and there. I don't know how it leaked out. But that, that particularly was not supposed to be released uh, under any given circumstance. And somehow it got out there. And so um, Breaking and Entering, that, uh, so anyhow, with all those pieces to the puzzle, I got to meet all those guys and cross paths with them. And um, yeah, man, it, it just really fulfilled what I set out to do at that time. So then, then comes production and then you know, those experiences. So so from, okay, so now, still on Mugs, still on Soul Assassins, what's to become those things, Cypress Hill, Funk Dubious, House of Pain. Kid Frost is, is the first guy that I went on tour with. And so we would invite as I developed my, my relationship with Frost, I had the Cypress Hill demo with me. I would play that Cypress Hill demo for Frost, and I would tell him, yo, these guys are going to blow. These guys are going to do something special, man. He started listening to the cassette along with me because we'd be different random places, and I just played for him just to let him know that there was something brewing up. So after a while... We, he, met, he met them through me, actually. We would invite Spin Dog and Be Real to go and rock with us at the end of our shows, freestyle, come and freestyle with us. It happened one time because I saw them, and then we, they, they, they met, and then all of a sudden I was like, they just, they just ended up on stage with us. Like, you know, we would invite other MCs that were in the place that we knew. We'd be like, hey, yo, you know what? After, after the show, we want to do a freestyle session. Are y'all, you guys want to join us? And then they'd be like, yeah, hell yeah. We want to get in front of the crowd? Hell yeah. So after the show, boom, here we go. We're rapping. I'm DJing. Of course, Frost is rapping, and now he's inviting Cypress Hill to come on stage, and nobody knows who they are. I mean, they're talking about smoking weed, and people are looking at us like, what? I'll never forget. We did a show at Magic Mountain that was an amusement park, and we let Be Real, and it was a Kid Frost show. At the end of the show, Frost, of course, we do our routine, boom, and then, of course, we invite Sam and Be Real because they showed up. They came to the show to back us up. We invite them on stage. I literally remember when we invited them on stage to freestyle with us, there were people walking out 
Like literally, like, what is that? Ah, oh, we don't want to hear that. What? That guy's cursing. We got kids here. What is he talking about? Talking about killing somebody? What? Ah. You know, because they were kicking the lyrics to, like, kill a man at that time. You know, that was still the, the baby that was being, um, what do you call it? It was, you know, we were still growing that seed. That seed was still, um, you know, in its embryonic stages. You know, and I'll never forget, like, somebody's these little kid's mother was, like, literally disappointed in us. Like, oh, my God, like, how dare you invite these guys on stage and talking about that kind of stuff? Wow, well, they were walking out mad at us. We were tripping. We were just like, damn, what the hell? What's going cool? on? Like, we were just tripping because we liked that. Of course, we could relate to that, but, you know, it, was, it had its shock value and Cypress Hill hadn't been accepted yet. You know, and so I'll never forget, we even introduced them to um, MF Doom who later would become MF Doom, KMD at the time. We did about, I'll say about a good mm, two weeks worth of shows with them, on and off. We did about a good 15 shows or so with them because of this movement that was taking place in 1990. It was called Censorship is Un-American. And that was at the time when these record labels and the radio, uh, when, when the whole warning, that whole, you know, um, they were blaming rap for violence and for explicit lyrical content and when they were really on the rappers like when Ice-T came out with the cop killer and you know what I'm saying like with all those with that whole movement I'll never forget there was this guy and you can look up the video there's a video of AM of KMD excuse me of, of, of Zeb Love X who was later became MF Doom he's literally talking to Congress in Washington you can look it up you can be like Zeb Love X speaks to Congress about censorship in America, you know, and, and he's explaining to them very intelligently, too. And it was funny because we crossed paths, man, even though I never got to see Doom again after that. And before Sub Rock died, I rocked shows along with Kid Frost and Spend Dog and Be Real with Zeb Love X and his little brother, Sub Rock. And, of course, the other guy, I forgot, I, it's sad that we don't remember. That guy was cool, too, the third member of KMD. Um, I just can't remember his name at this moment, but he was a really good dude, too, man. Real cool guys, man. They were really cool. And I'm just so happy that we crossed paths with him when we did those shows. I'll never forget the look that, that MF Doom had when he heard Be Real kick the Stone is the Way of the Walk verse. When b Will got on the free, when he got on the mic, we were somewhere in like Berkeley doing a show. It was outdoors, and we were on the stage. And Cypress was about to, now they were about to drop their first album. So this is like still 91, although it's probably like spring of 91, maybe mm, going into summer. And we're doing this show at this, some college in Berkeley, somewhere up there in, in Frisco, or somewhere in the Bay Area. And b Real gets on the mic, and he's like, well, it's the alley cat puffing on the hoodie Mac. Some say I'm a criminal. Yo, I ain't all of that. That first to the stone. I'll never forget how, how Zeb Love X, which is MF Doom, rest in peace, looked up. And the look in his eye, when I saw how excited he got when he heard that lyric, he was like, oh, you know, like when you hear that lyric, when you hear that verse, that you didn't expect, and all of a sudden somebody's kicking that flavor. He looked up with that, with that, like, oh my God, what the? Because he was, he had, he was partying with us, but he went down in the crowd. He was partying like from the crowd. He was right at the front row, just checking us out, and you know, just having fun with the girls and dancing and kicking it. And we did some freestyle stuff with him as well. When, when, but that, but that particular day, B Real and Sam came with us, and and they got on the mic, and I'll never forget the look that was on MF Doom's face when he saw Be Real Ryan for the first time. It was dope, man. That was a great feeling, too, to see that, man. You know what I'm saying? And then, of course, that summer, Cypress Hill drops, Muggs creates Soul Assassins, and um, I become the first member of Soul Assassins, you know, due to due to the uh, connection that we had from 89 until then. Even though I took a short break from recording with Cypress Hill, I went back and reunited with them, and we started to hang out more based off of the success that I had uh, actually landed with Kid Frost. Because at that point, Muggs was still proud of me. He was like, yo, I was like, yo, dude, y'all are doing your thing. I love the record. This is an exciting time. Spanglish rap is in full effect, you know, as far as the notoriety. All these kids that are coming out to these concerts, 
you know, it's very, it was very exciting to have a hit record on a power station because it hadn't been done yet, you know. And literally, those are the pioneers of changing the format. Kid Frost, Mellow Man Ace, those guys were, and of course, Candyman. They're the first guys that literally helped that to push that envelope for, for hip-hop to be accepted. Even though, like, Candyman had the song Knockin' Boots, it was a commercial-based song talking about girls and having sex and partying. And Mellow Man Ace, same thing, talking about a girl who's a liar. Mentirosa, big hit records, though, huge. And then Kid Frost was probably the most gangster Spanglish rap song of all time to get on the radio across all those stations, to get MTV. Because, you know, we did the UMTV raps. We did the Pump It Ups with D-Barnes. You know, I mean, it was amazing. It was accepted, and it was the first of its kind. And so I'm very grateful and very proud to be a part of that movement and to, to be proud to say, hey, I was to keep watching DJ to help push the envelope of that movement, you know? And also, when you actually talked about going on tour, man, I want to jump ahead to 99. I actually read that you actually took part in uh, the Underdogs tour, where you actually rocked 30 shows, man, all over the world with Exhibit, A Tribe Called Quest, and many other legendary acts. And I was wondering, man, what was it like just being on tour with those acts, man? Because honestly, just just the sounds of that concert, you know what I mean, in 1999 would have been lit. Yeah, man, it's okay, so check it out. We go to like... It's literally like around this time. It's like in early May, it's like spring break of, we toured in, in, uh, in April of 1999. Rest in peace to Fife Dog, because today is the day that he passed away. 322 is Fife Dog Day for me, you know, forever. And I've been listening to his music all day today, man. Listening to that Midnight Marauders, man. Oh, my God, I, I love that album, as well as the other albums. I just really fell in love with, like, like the song, like, God Lives Through, which later, you know, they had little bits and pieces of Oh My God. Like, it sounds like you could hear that blend in there. It was a trip how they combined those two elements, those two songs to create a, a remix. Okay, so check it out. So, so Fife Dog, we get the opportunity to travel with him. And now it's just Fife solo, right? It's not, uh, it's not Trap Call Quest. It was, it was Defari, Exhibit, and Fife Dog. He's on a solo run on this particular tour. And so uh, this is the this is right when uh, Exhibit just recorded "Be Please" or "Bitch Please" with Dr. Dre and Snoop. So even Exhibit is still on the underground and has not gotten his recognition. Uh, you know, across, he's not a worldwide name, household name, if you will. After he connected with Snoop and started touring that same year, that's when his whole life changed. I was there to see that. I got an opportunity to work with Exhibit for his first album, although the song never made the album, but we knew each other since about 1995. And we had uh, somewhat of, a, of, a, of a, a friendship that we had cultivated. And so, um, 1999, I see Jafar at like, literally at this, uh, I was invited to do an interview at a radio show, radio station. And so at that radio station, Jafar is there with his manager who was a guy named Suave, who was Tone Loke's, like, one of his early road managers. He looks just like them. They're like cousins or something. That's what people used to always say, like, Tone Loke and Suave are brothers. So Suave is managing Exhibit, and he's managing Defari at the time. And Defari just landed that deal on Tommy Boy Records. So I'm at this panel discussion for this radio station, and they see me there. And they're like, yo, what are you doing from this date to that date? And then and Kafar is excited, telling Swab, like, yo, yo, let's get him. We need to get, we need to get Ralph M. We need to get Ralph M. I want him to be my DJ for this tour. So I agreed. I was like, hell yeah. And I already had a pretty strong rapport with Kafar because he had done a couple projects with East Swift that were on our label, which was on Immortal Records. We were on Immortal Epic, but Immortal Records was still its own independent label, and Kafar had worked on a compilation on, for that label. Uh, produced by E. Swift. And then so, um, okay, so from there, I get to roll on that tour. And I was excited because that's a tour that, that literally, like, uh, Fred Reck was there. He was the uh, sound he was the sound engineer for Exhibit. And Sir Jinx was the DJ, right? So, Sir Jinx, so we got a little bit of everybody. We got members of, uh, you know, CIA slash NWA. Uh, Fred Reck, of course, later to become part of Snoop Dogg, DPG Camp, along with Dr. Dre, et cetera, you know, production-wise. And so um, 
that tour was fun, man. I mean, we went through everything from tour buses breaking down to people getting arrested to people dying on us. Like, that was a tour that uh, Roger Troutman died on. We had Columbine, you know, the massacre. Speaking of which, we had another uh, some type of shooting in Boulder, Colorado today, you know what I mean? So history repeats itself, right? But the thing with that, that particular tour was we were all on the same tour bus, the far right, we were well rehearsed, you know, we were ready to rock. And so um, what an interesting time as well, man. We crossed paths with a little bit of everybody on that tour. And, uh, yeah, man, it's an exciting time to hang out with Fife, man. That was the first time I really got to meet Fife and hang out with him. He knew who Funk Dubious was because he loved that record, Rock On. You know, Tribe Called Quest, uh, Ali Shaheed Muhammad and Q-Tip and Fife Dog, they, they, they really respected the, the song on the second album, Rock On, by Funk Dubious. And I, and I was proud of that, man, because I was like, yo, like, you guys actually know who we are. Like, that's pretty, another accomplishment there. You know what I mean? Tribe Called Quest is no joke. I mean, literally, I was still in high school when that record came out, you know. So, um, you know, uh, so from there, you know, I, did, I got some good footage of Fife. I got some pictures with him. I got some good stuff. And so on his day, man, you know, I definitely want to raise a glass and say salute and respect to him forever. So on that tour, you know, boom, we're moving along. We're touring. We're, we're doing shows every other night. And uh, we're, we're getting busy, you know. So that was a successful tour. And, um, yeah, man, 22 years later, bro. Well, you know, can you imagine that? <laughs> And I, I got to say as well, man, the one question I actually, the next question I have is like so jumping ahead to like 2004, man, because, you know, I've, I've personally sat back and listened to this series. And I, I, I love it, man. I love the nostalgia feel to it. But you actually have your own compilation series titled K-Day AM Stereo 1580 Mix Sessions, man. I was wondering, can you tell oh, our yeah. listeners a bit more about those? And do you have any future plans to actually create any more? Because those are absolute fire. I looked on the internet, and there are, people are selling their copies for like 900 bucks to $1,000. Oh, 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 oh. See, thank you for the feedback, man. Are you kidding me? That is amazing. That is amazing. $900. Come on, y'all. That is too much, man. I love it. I love it. Thank you for increasing the value of those mixes. I really, you know what I'm doing right now? I'm actually recording. This is a forthcoming project, and you're the first to hear about this, okay? See, like I said, I wanted to bring something special to the Outlaw Radio um, airwaves. Uh, of course, I'm working on a project with Strictly Cassette. If you go online, look up Strictly Cassette. And on Facebook, it's Rap Tape. It's actually both Facebook and Instagram, Rap Tape, Strictly Cassette. Two separate pages, although it's the same company. Check them out. I'm working on a project with them. It's going to be a mixtape. We're doing a cassette, but we're doing a collectible cassette. And I'm going to put nothing but strictly instrumentals, all brand new instrumentals, fresh off the SP-1200 and the NPC-3000. So um, for those out there who are listening, as well as yourself, you'll be the first to know that um, we already got half of the recordings done. So I just went in about a week ago, or I went in a few days ago and started to record the first side of the of the, of the 60 minute um, beat tape that I'm going to be that we're going to be releasing uh, very soon. And I mean, we're working and we got some good ideas for this project. Now we're not just going to release a cassette; we're going to make it very very special. It's very collectible. If you go online and look up strictly cassette rap tape. It's two separate words, right? It's two separate pages, but it's the same company. You'll see what the packaging and what I'm talking about. Very incredible. And speaking of Trap Hall Quest, like he did a really special one. Like the cassettes and the artwork and the design, very exclusive. And it's one-of-a-kind stuff that uh, is available for the consumers out there. So Ralph Lamb is going to be dropping an instrumental beat tape, mixtape, a real mixtape, not on CD. And it's going to be, I'm excited about that, because it's going to be new music, you know, from a, from my perspective as far, but it's that raw, underground, gutty, I mean, you know, it's that gully shit. You know, it's like Red Funk Dubious with Soul Assassins, what Ralph M is known for providing. So I'm not going to try to switch up how I do things. I'm just trying to put it into a 2021 format and still make it interesting and collectible. And I'm going to be dropping some more stuff 
after that, but I want people to really tune into this because I'm really putting my heart and soul into this. And like I said the other day, man, we went in and started recording some of the first parts. And, yo, I'm going to bring it, y'all. I'm not holding back. I'm going to give you something that's going to be very tasty, very palatable, and uh, it's going to be raw dog, boom, bap, straight up. But it's not, it's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to have that, that, that excitement that I like to bring to the table. I feel good about it, you know, and so I'm excited about that. And yeah, I mean, I want to create another mix, uh, K Day mix series. I think this will be like a continuation of that because I'm kind of going in that mindset, except I'm doing it from not necessarily playing classic hip hop records, but playing my own instrumentals with that classic approach, you know. So stay tuned for that. That's going to be something extra special. You can find me at, at Funk Dubious Music on Instagram and on Facebook, if you will, uh, D double E space J A Y space Ralph space M. And so, um, and on the Twitch.tv and the YouTube channels will be coming soon, as soon as the project is ready for, for delivery. But, um, yeah, bro, that's where I'm at right now. I'm definitely in the lab right now creating something new and um, exciting. And something that, that that no one has heard yet, as far as instrumentals are concerned, as far as people that know me. And I gotta say as well, you know what I mean. That project sounds absolutely phenomenal. And I also want to say my apologies. I actually brought up that link that I actually had here, and I want to say it's not nine hundred bucks. Actually, it's like mm-hmm. triple that. It's actually two thousand one hundred and thirty-seven dollars and ninety-nine cents. And they even slapped on a five-dollar delivery charge too. So you know. <laughs> I love it. These guys are hustling. I love that. Man, that is amazing. Now, we did Golden B-Boys, and I know that that had a nice market value as well. I still have some of those CDs available. If you want to get at me, reach out to me, funkdubiousmusic at yahoo.com. There's still some Golden B-Boys CD, you know, the release, original print, still available for the cats out there that, you know, want to get it in. Definitely email me. I'll give you the PayPal information, which is literally PayPal. What is it? Pay, uh, PayPal. Yes, yeah, PayPal underscore funk dubious music at yahoo.com. At Yahoo, if you will. So, uh, you know, you know the drill, but funk dubious music at Yahoo for purchase for, the, for CD orders on, on uh, Golden B Boys, which was our fourth album. Independent project released on CD and through the, uh, you know, uh, what do you call that? Uh, digital distribution, if you will. You know, but that, those those are still available. And you know, anybody out there that wants a collectible CD, definitely get at me. Um, it's got the beautiful artwork. It's got the stickers. It's got every the full packaging. When I set out to do this project, I knew that I had to do it based on what we're already accustomed to, and that's nothing less than than a one thousand. You know what I'm saying? Like I want, I want to give you quality music, quality packaging, and something that's timeless in both of those regards. And if you don't mind me asking as well, that way our listeners, when they hit you up, they can be they can come PayPal ready with the right amount of funds. How much actually are those projects that you're selling? Well, for international, I'm trying to do at least, well, I'm trying to do $50 because the packaging and the, and the uh, you know, the, the, the actual, uh, so for the shipping, don't quote me, but for, I think for Canada, I could still get it for like 16 bucks. So I'm going to start, I'll start at 50, okay, you guys? Anybody out there that's looking forward to that, definitely get at me and get them while they're hot because uh, they will sell fast at this point based on what's happening out there in the Internet. That's oh, most definitely. That's where I'm at. And I'll ship them anywhere in the world. You just got to give me the opportunity to find out. Like if you're somewhere deep, deep in the world, and I got to make sure that, that that postage is paid. And sometimes that postage can be $20. It could be, you know, 15 to 20, sometimes more. It just depends where it's going. So if I quote a different price based on the packaging, I'll show you the proof of what I need to, you know, as far as the mailing and the postage that needs to be paid. Because that's important, man. You know, I don't I don't like people to, you know, to think that, oh, well, he charged me this, he charged me that, or, you know, that kind of thing. I don't like to play games with, but please understand that, that I am, we are an independent company, and, we, and you know, those costs, those incurred costs, you know, they come back, you know, they, 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 they tap our pocketbooks, put it that way. You know what I'm saying? And we want to make sure that our pocketbooks are covered as well as the shipping and, um, you know what I'm saying, the, the, the cost, the international fees and stuff like that. So, yeah, definitely Golden D-Boy CD still available. And um, what else did I want to say about it? Yeah, so, 
some of the merch. I'm working on some merch as well. I got some special t- stuff for this year. This is the Soul Assassins 30-year Cypress Hill 30-year anniversary. Definitely look forward to that. Please connect with me at Funk Dubious Music on Instagram and at Funk Dubious Music at Yahoo.com for purchase orders, etc. And quickly, I got to ask: If people actually purchase a CD, can they actually request you to actually autograph it? Because I know they're probably in plastic, but upon request, yeah. could you actually remove the plastic and actually autograph it for them as well? I could do that, sure. I mean, you know, that that, that could be done. I mean, it just depends on on uh, you know if you if you if you're cool with that. You know, if you're cool with somebody opening the package up and sending it that way, then so be it. Um, you know, it's all how you want to receive your packaging because it is packaged very lovely with the plastic I mean everything it's 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 hooked up man it's definitely hooked up with the embossing on, on the CD like I went all out because I wanted to create something special that was important for us to have going and in, going into this came out it's like almost 10 years ago you know it came out in 2000 literally it is 10 years it's, it's literally celebrated its 10th anniversary in 2009 so we're going on, what, 20, 10, 11 years almost? Yeah, at least 11 years. So, um, Talk about deja uh, vu, you know what I mean? That's uh, It's hard to believe that's actually had that, that long ago. I'm, I'm telling you, man, I couldn't believe it either. I started <laughs> in 2006, and by 2008, I was mixing. You know, because I want, you know, when we get, when I get into something, man, I really dig through it. I really am critical. I'm very honest with myself. I'm honest with others. It's important because because the product suffers when you're not. And so I've learned a lot since then also, just in terms of my approach and what I need to be aware of, you know, and things like that. So that that really got me, um, a, uh, you know, it's funk, it, we, we're distributing it through our own label, which is Funk Dubious Music, you know, and it's just been, uh, it's been a beautiful struggle, although, you know, it's... Uh, I wish, uh, you know, I wish I had access to, to be able to provide something that would be a million seller. You know what I mean? And I know it's out there and the worth value is up. I'm just saying in terms of this project because I only cracked up a certain amount. It's a limited, collectible amount of CDs for this album. So, yeah, thank you for everybody. Uh, thank you to everybody that bought Golden B-Boys. And there it is there. Still available, y'all. And I gotta say, first and foremost, there, Ralph, just thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy evening and just sharing some amazing, in-depth stories and dropping some gems on us. Uh, I gotta say, it was an honor and most definitely a privilege, man. You most definitely inspired a lot of individuals to do what they do, man. And I gotta say, thank you to you as well because if it wasn't for Mix Master, Mix Master Ralph, man, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be a DJ. You know what I mean? You paved the way for people hey, like man. me, so thank you. Hey, man, thank you for the kind words. Thank you for the opportunity. And I hope to meet you someday. And, of course, man, I'm here for you, man. When this project comes out, I want to come back and do something and uh, promote that uh, Strictly Cassette project that I'm doing. Big, big, big ups to my, to my cats out there that are supporting. And, uh, you know, definitely stay in tune with me, at Funk Dubious Music on Instagram. Uh, check me out, at Strictly Cassette. That's forthcoming. But go tap in. There's a lot of great music that that's, be, that's being provided through those collectible um, collectible cassettes, if you will. I mean, the packaging is incredible, bro. This ain't just some regular cassette that we're going to put out there. We go into every detail of the artwork, of the packaging, the quality of the cassette, the quality of the casing. I'm just going to let you in on a secret. It's going to be something you're going to want to buy. And when you see it, you're going to know what I'm talking about. So check them out at, at Strictly Cassette on Instagram, at Rap Tape on Instagram, and Facebook as well. DJ Ralph M signing off, y'all. Thank you so much, man. DJ Immortal. Hey, man, you already know what to do, DJ Ralph. Thank you so much, and have yourself a wonderful night, and most definitely stay safe out there on the West Coast. All right, big up to Toronto, y'all. Salute, and uh, definitely, man, salute to you as well. Continued success, and thank you for the opportunity to share my story. Although... Uh, there's more, so don't trip. There will be another, uh, we will have another interview, uh, you know, Lord willing. Hey, man, most definitely, you're always welcome on, you're always welcome on 97.7 Outlaw Radio FM, man. You just give me the word, and we can make it happen. Outlaw Radio 97.7 FM, worldwide, 
Funk Dubious Forever, DJ Ralph M, Original 1580 K-Day Mix Masters. Salute and respect, always.